Welcome to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Pee Wee Valley Baptist Church in Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of 2 Corinthians. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Some may be saying, when is he going to stop talking about giving? When we run out of scripture that talks about giving, that's when. Um, and um, this, is, this is instructive and this is needful for each of us to understand God's perspective on giving, else we wouldn't get it right. So 2 Corinthians, stand with me if you're able, and follow along at the reading of God's Word, beginning in chapter 9 and verse 6. We're going to read down to verse 11 today. But this I say, he who soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he who soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever." Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. Father, teach us and guide us through your word today. Impress upon our hearts the certainty of your principles and the truths that's found in your word regarding this grace of giving. May we respond in a manner that would be pleasing in your eyes, and may we live a life that is patterned after your principles on giving. We'll give you praise and thanks for what you'll do in this hour, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. Just a brief review, because we're into part five of our study now. We don't want to lose sight of the, the, the context of where we, where we are at this point in time. We started this back in the first part of chapter eight. And um, in part one, we talked about giving according to God's will. We see that in chapter eight and verse five, the Macedonians... Uh, They did not as we hoped, but first gave themselves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So we need to give according to God's will. Uh, Giving is a grace that is given to us according to chapter 8 and verse 1. We make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. We need to abound in this grace according to verse 7 of chapter 8. At the end it says, see that ye abound in this grace also. So it's not just the grace of God that's given to us regarding giving, but we need to do it according to His will, and we need to do it um, in such a manner that we abound in that. And we talked about Christ being that perfect example, how much He gave to us in chapter 8 and verse 9, that though He was rich, yet for our sakes He became poor, that we through His poverty might be rich. And so uh, that was part one that we studied. In part two, we're supposed to give proportionate to our ability. In verse three of chapter eight, for to their power, that word power means ability. That is the ability of the Macedonians from verse one. For to their ability, I bear record or witness, yea, and beyond their ability, they were willing of themselves. So we um, give proportionate to our ability And we're supposed to do that willingly, according to chapter 8 and verse 12. For if there be first a willing mind. Uh, And then we looked at verses 13 and 14, how that we are to give equitably, if you will. There it says, for I mean not that 
Other men be eased and you be burdened, but by an equality, that's an equity, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want because they had something excess and the church at Jerusalem did not, which is where that gift was being taken. And then in part three, uh, we talked about there being no excuses. A good example is at chapter 8 and verse 2. Uh, even though the Macedonians had this great trial of affliction, um, they still had an abundance of joy and they had deep poverty. They still abounded to the riches of liberality. And if you look at verse 24 of chapter 8, no excuses. It says, therefore, show ye to them uh, and before the churches the proof of your love. So we understand this is an opportunity to prove our love for others. And then last week in part four, we talked about not being sidetracked. In verses 10 and 11 of chapter 8, it says, In this I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be willing a year ago. They had, they had been willing and ready a year prior. They didn't do it. So in verse 11, Paul exhorted them to perform the doing of it, get it done. And then in chapter 9 and verse 2, where we studied last week, for I know uh, the forwardness means readiness. I know the readiness of your mind for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia, that is Corinth, Corinth and other uh, churches, was ready a year ago and your zeal hath provoked many. So it's been in a, their zeal and their enthusiasm and their readiness and their willingness to give was, in a, was an inspiration to others, but they still hadn't gotten it done. So don't get sidetracked, no excuses, give proportionate to ability, if you will, and give according to God's word and his will, uh, understanding that it's a grace given to us from God and abound in that giving. Now, we come to our lesson today. And in chapter 9 and verse 6, I call this uh, give generously. Part 5 is give generously. Uh, so we understand from chapter 8 and verse 1 that giving is a grace of God that has been given to us. And so God wants us to give generously. And that's, that's the, the theme of these next few verses beginning at verse 6. What we find here, I uh, call this first point, the floundering and flourishing. <laughs> the floundering and flourishing. And I call this the degree of giving. The degree of giving. It's almost like the magnitude of giving. Uh, what, what or how much we are to give. Because uh, people always struggle with that, if you will. And this is by way of principle. The good thing, uh, it's good because God gave it to us to be such. The good thing is everybody's not tied to just the 10%. That was the, that was the format in the Old Testament. But we understand God has a different format for giving, and it's, it's not 10% of what we have. Um, there are some people who might not be able to give 10% of what they have on a regular basis. There are other people that uh, they would be short uh, shorthanding themselves and God's will if they were to only give 10%. And there's all in between there. Uh, uh, the great uh, Letourneau, who built a, a, a multi-million dollar business, uh, gave 90% of what he had to the Lord. If 10% would have been the, the mandate, just think of how much uh, he'd have had to hold back for himself or to give to somebody else. And so that it wasn't part of the will of God. But it was God's will for him to do that, and he did that. And he did it as he purposed in his heart. A phrase that we're going to come to in just a little bit here as we go on. But here beginning in verse 6, the scripture says, But this I say, he who soweth sparingly, and sowing is giving. Sowing is laying down that. It's, it's, it's sowing what God has given to us. It's a metaphorical use of that which is given for uh, agriculturally to the sowing seed in a field and reaping a harvest. And if you, re if, if you eat all that harvest, you don't have anything to put back into the ground. So it's that process of knowing how to do that. 
Good farmers can make a lot out of a little because God gives great increase according to their faith. Um, if, if the farmer is a believer, if they're not a believer, God can bring a drought, uh, even though they may give plentifully. But here I want to talk about a contrast, the floundering and the flourishing. Floun- and I use these words uh, intently because to flounder means to struggle or to stagger. Um, perhaps confused, if you will, uncertain as to what to do. Um, and flourishing refers to a healthy, invigorating, successful state of activity or production. So you're either floundering in the area of giving on one end of the spectrum, or you're flourishing in the grace of giving. Um, I think most people are probably somewhere in between. Perhaps leaning towards floundering, some leaning towards flourishing. What would characterize, and let's ask ourselves this question, what would characterize our giving? Just give it a thought for, for our own self. Am I flourishing or floundering? Am I really doing what God wants me to do? Sometimes we take what, what God wants us to do and we sort of hold back part of that uh, and, and we use it as an excuse not to give it because it would be more frugal to hold on to it and not to just sort of throw it to the wind. And what we're going to find out is giving according to God's will is, is, is premeditated and determined as each person is led of God in their hearts to give. It's an individualized thing. And we can't use that as an excuse, well, then I can just sort of give what I want to give. No, we have to give. We saw that. We have to give according to God's will. That's what the Macedonians did. This is the example that's given to us. And this this scripture is a lengthy scripture on giving. And it's there for a reason. Because people will misuse and abuse the grace of giving that's given to them by the Lord. And we don't want to flounder with that. You know, we, we're from uh, Virginia Beach, and there's, a, there's an inlet from the Chesapeake Bay uh, called Rudy Inlet. I mean, I mean, there's an inlet there, and, and the water is a very small inlet. It's only maybe 20, <clears throat> 30 feet across. And <clears throat> all the inland water in Virginia Beach there is tidal water. And all this water comes in through that opening, and it just comes in. And it looks just as calm as the bay does. Um, uh, out in the middle, because the bay is kind of calm. The ocean's kind of rough out there, but the bay is kind of calm. But at this one point, close to where the ocean and the bay meet, this water comes in, feeds all these tributaries, all of these lakes, and it's all tidal water. And then when the tide goes out, that stuff goes back out. And so water's constantly passing through that little channel. It's only about 20, 30 feet wide. It's the most dangerous spot in Virginia Beach to get in the water. Hundreds of people have been killed because the water looks calm. It's not very far to the other side, maybe here to the the back of the church. And people get in, they're just going to swim over there. What they can't see is the undercurrent. It is strong and it is deep, very deep. And when you get in there and it just sort of, it's gone. And it's, you can't find it anymore. Um, And so... Uh, You know, sometimes we live our lives cautiously. Sometimes we live them recklessly. God wants us to live our lives righteously, which means that we predetermine and premeditate. It's not a spontaneous thing by way of the, the, the normal order of giving that God has. It doesn't mean that God won't move us in a heartbeat to give somebody something or to make an outpouring. I understand that. But as a matter of practice of our giving, it should be premeditated and determined ahead of time what we're going to do. It's something that we spend some time on it. So here we have in verse 6, that the one who sows sparingly, that is the one who is, because we could call this being stingy or being generous. So the one who's sparingly, floundering if you will, 
<coughs> with how to give according to God's will, using that as an excuse to sort of hold on some things. And so we don't want to let all of it go because we got to feel we got to protect something. And so where's the faith? Where's the faith? <coughs> um, some people are afraid to give because they're not sure that what they're giving away is actually going to come back. The scripture says that it'll come back multifold to us. If we give according to God's word, God, and we'll see that later in our, in our study today, that when we're floundering, things aren't going well and God's not blessing that. But when we're flourishing in the will of God and we're giving as God wants us to give, it's not the amount that we have, but it's according to the ability that we have. It's that we give proportionately. Saw that in chapter 8. We give proportionate to what we have. People say, well, that's 10%. Proportionate to what we have is not 10%. Proportionate to what we have is as God, as God and, and lets us know what His will is through His Word, and we exercise God's will, and then we purpose in our heart what we're going to give. It's as God leads us. People want to put... A number on it. They want to say, well, this is an obligation. This is my monthly bill. Uh, we need to give according with God's leading and God's direction in our life. And we can't know what God's will is concerning our giving unless we're studying the scriptures. Can't. It's not possible to know. God doesn't just feed us because we think that it's a good thing to study the scriptures. He blesses us because we actually do study the scriptures with a purpose in mind. That is that we can please him even more so in the future than we have already. So sowing sparingly is not only stingy, but it's, it's practicing careful restraint. Some people call that being frugal. And so that's where we get a little confused. God doesn't, God being frugal in a true sense, being, being, being just with what we're doing in a responsible fashion. He would say, well, I wouldn't give that much. That's not responsible. Uh, each believer gives according as they purpose in their heart being led by the will of God. We'll get more into that phrase in just a minute. But sparingly means that we're somehow restraining or refraining, uh, that we have an excuse not to give generously for some reason. We do it in a restricted or an infrequent manner. Perhaps we don't... Uh, give as much as we ought to. We're being sort of thrifty. We love the idea of being thrifty in so many things. The grace of giving is not the area to thrift. It's the area where we need to please God and how He leads us uh, in our own individual response to His will. Now, well, the other side of the coin in verse 5 is, that's the floundering, but then there's the flourishing. In verse 6 it says, He who soweth sparingly reaps sparingly, so if we're, going to be, if we're going to be restrained in our giving, God's going to hold back that which otherwise he would give to us. It would be flourishing in our giving. Because if we sow sparingly, we reap sparingly. It's a biblical principle. Sometimes we don't think about that principle when we decide what to give. The other side of that is that he who soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Now, what do you think the word bountifully means? Uh, surprising, it doesn't mean abundance. It does not mean abundance. Remember, God's expectation is that we not we give a lot. That we are to give according to our ability. Now, what did the Macedonians do? They gave according to their ability, according to the early verses in chapter 8. But then they went over and beyond their ability. That's okay. Because that's how God led them and they purposed in their hearts as a congregation. They were going to go beyond their ability to do it. And God honored that. God honored that. So if we sow bountifully, we shall reap bountifully. So what does bountifully mean if it doesn't mean abundance? <clears throat> the word literally means blessing. It means blessing or praise. The Greek word for bountifully is the root word where we get eulogy from. Eulogy means to praise 
or to bless someone. We see it in funerals all the time. That's what the word bountifully means. Now look at Romans chapter 15, just to, to give a little sense of this, as it's, as it's used in other scriptures. Um, in Romans 15, and look down to verse 29. <clears throat> Romans 15 and verse 29. Here, Paul writing to the church at Rome and said, And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now, it's not talking about giving here, not talking about giving, but the same word is used here in a different sense. And that is with the fullness of the blessing of the gospel. Blessing is the bountifulness, the bountifulness of the gospel of Christ. Now, in, in this context in Romans 15, he was talking about giving. If you go back to verse 27, it says, It hath, it hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, then um, duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. And that would be in material things. When therefore, in verse 28, I have performed this and have sealed uh, to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. So he's talking about taking money, if you will, and carrying a gift, not the one to Jerusalem. But in verse 29, he says, I am sure that when I come unto you, when I come for a different purpose, <clears throat> I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Because that's what he was called. He was called to minister the gospel of Christ to the Gentiles. And he said, I'm going to be coming in the blessing of the gospel. So bountifulness in our text in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 is blessing. It's a blessing to others, if you will. Now, another place. Look at Ephesians 1, 3. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath also, here's our word, bountifully, in translated bountifully in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings, uh, literally in heavenly places in Christ. That he's blessed us. That's the bountifulness, if you will. Bountifulness is a blessing. One more place. Um, if you do uh, look at Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 7, the same word is used over here. Uh, it does. That's why studying the scriptures, you look at a word and say, well, I wonder what that word means. You may think you know what it means. I may think I know what it means. But maybe we ought to look it up to see what it really does mean. You ever get, uh, maybe you're reading a book. You ever read a book and you come across a word you don't understand what it means? And you go right on by it. If you were to stop and look it up, you get so much more meaning out of what you're reading because you understand what the author is trying to say. Well, we, of, of all the authors, ought to want to know what God is saying. But look in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 7. It says, for the earth, and this is, a, this is an analogy that's given here. Earth is analogous to believers. For the earth which drinketh in the rain, so the earth... Uh, is metaphorically used for believers. The rain is metaphorically used for the word of God. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh often upon it and bringeth forth herbs, meat or fit for them by whom it is uh, dressed or tilled receiveth blessing from God. The word blessing is the word bountifully in our text in Corinthians. So it says here that when that when the earth drinks the rain, that there's a, there's a blessing there. I mean, when we had this, uh, this rain that came a while back, my yard was sort of floundering. The grass wasn't growing. The weeds were kind of prominent. I'd put some stuff out, and things weren't really going. The trees were struggling. But then we got like two days of rain, and we got two and a quarter inches of rain at our place. And boy, after that, pew, Katie barred the door. I couldn't wait to get the lawnmower and get out because now the grass is too tall and the flowers are just beautiful. They're flourishing. And that's what happens in our giving as well 
as we go back to our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, this bountifulness means blessings, if you will. And so the principle is when we give generously according to God's will, it will bless others abundantly. And what will happen is they're going to, and we're going to talk about this at the end of our lesson, and they will give praise to God and thanks to Him for what's being done. Because somebody blessed them with a part of what God had given to them. So we don't want to be stingy. We want to be generous in our giving. Now in verse 7, our second point, the reluctance and rousing. Reluctance is sort of grudgingly. You see that in verse 7. Every man, this doesn't leave anybody out, every man according as he purposeth in his heart. So let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. God, I don't believe, is happy with the person who just comes and gives that same amount week after week. It's my job. It's a necessity. It's what God told me to give. I'm going to give that every week, and that's my giving. That's not what God wants from us by way of giving. Giving goes way beyond that. Yes, we have a responsibility to the local assembly in order to give so that the ministry can flourish locally. But this is just a part of our giving. Giving goes beyond the doors of the church. Uh, Our neighbors, our loved ones, our family, our friends, strangers around the world. We are to give, if you will. So this is reluctance, if you will. This uh, reluctance to give. Because it says here, it says not to give grudgingly. Grudgingly means out of sorrow or grief. It makes us sad. When we give that, oh, I really couldn't afford to give that today. It's insincerity in giving or out of necessity. Necessity is we sense an obligation. We sense it's necessary. We sense that there's some duty, some compulsion forces us to give that. And that's why we do it. When we give, it should always be a clear path from our mind and our heart to God. That I'm doing this for God. I'm not doing it because somebody told me to do it. I'm not doing it because the pastor told me to do it. I'm not doing it because everybody in the church is doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm doing it for God. Now, some will use that as an excuse to not give at all. But no, we can't can't do that. There's a word purpose here. I told you we'd get to it. So how is it we're supposed to give? I call this the disposition of giving. What is our posture? What is our mentality? What is our attitude towards giving? And here it is. It's found in purposes. Verse 7 says, Every man should give, is, is understood, according as he purposeth in his heart. Now you say, well, purpose. This is the only time this word is used in the New Testament. And of course, Greek words aren't used in the Old Testament. It's the only time this word's used in the Bible, this word purpose it. And it means premeditated, predetermined plan of action. Premeditated, predetermined. You purpose something. You know, if we, if we develop in our, in our mind a purpose for something, it usually takes a little bit of time. You take a little bit of time. Otherwise, if we do something spontaneously, we haven't thought about a purpose. We just did it because we thought it was the thing to do at that time. So we don't want to give spontaneously in that sense. The word actually means thought out well. We need to predetermine. We need to think ahead of time. Literally, it means uh, done from the heart voluntarily, not compulsively. It's predetermined. Predetermined. So we predetermine what we're going to give. The one uh, that we are to, every man is to give as he predetermines in his heart. And that's under the leadership of the Holy Spirit who leads and guides us into the truth. So God is the, is the source of the target of those actions and those thoughts that we have. 
It's a purpose. And not just a purpose, but it's a premeditated, predetermined plan of action done voluntarily from the heart, not impulsively. And then he says, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. That's how we're to give. If you want to know how to give, that's the answer. That's it. Understanding the appropriate use of the word purpose in the King James. And that necessarily is, in, in, is inside. Let him give, not grudgingly, not of necessity. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. The word cheerful comes from the Greek word hilaro, H-I-L-A-R-O, hilaro. It's our root word for hilarious, literally hilariously. That's what the word means. God loves a giver who gives to the point of hilarity. But it doesn't mean that we have to burst out with laughing, but it means that we have predetermined, we've premeditated our giving, and we're doing it in a fashion <clears throat> that God has designed for us because God has given to us through His Word, His will, and we understand that, and we predetermine as God has led us to give. And so we can't look at anybody else to see what they're giving or why they're giving. We look to the source of our knowledge and the source of what's right from God Himself. And that's the purposing, if you will, of our giving. That's, again, we give not out of necessity or grudgingly, but we do give according as He purposeth in our, in our hearts. God loves a cheerful giver. It's not just an add-on at the end of the verse. It's a characterization of what giving is as God has given that to us all the way through from, from chapter 8 and verse 1 to this point. God loves a cheerful giver. You can look at every aspect going down this. God loves a cheerful giver. And a cheerful giver is one who premeditates, predetermined ahead of time according to the will of God and decides this is what I'm going to give. And then the third point starts in verse 8, and that is, the, I call it the ebbing and the enriching. You know, you got the ebb and flow with the tide. You know, the ebbing is when it draws back, and you know, and you got the, the flow when the water comes in and the tide gets high, and it seems to be abundant at that time, if you will. Well, the ebbing, you know, because these verses say, beginning in verse 8, and God is able... <laughs> Stop right there and soak that in for just a little bit. Just let it soak in. God is able. Many times what affects our giving to give cheerfully, to give willingly, to give not grudgingly, not out of compulsion, not out of necessity, but to give according as a purpose in our heart as we understand the will of God and apply the will of God in our life. God is able. God is able. And he characterizes this, and God is able to what? This is one of the absolute greatest verses in the Scripture. It says, I didn't say the greatest, one of the greatest. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. You can apply this to salvation, because it's the grace of God that brought salvation to us, right? It's the grace of God that brings His Word to us. It's the grace of God that brought life to us. It's the grace of God that brings an eternal inheritance to us. And God is able to make all grace abound. The word bound means lavishly. God is able to make all grace abound toward you as an individual. Why? The word that answers why. Why is, would God make all grace abound towards us? Why? That ye... Catch this, always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. This, this phrase follows God loves a cheerful giver. It follows that if we give, if we sow bountifully, we'll reap bountifully. Cheerfully giving, what, because it's not ours to start with, giving what God has blessed us with, 
given a portion of that because we give proportionately according to our ability and says that we're able, God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always at all times having all sufficiency, always having all sufficiency. That doesn't mean always having everything I want. It doesn't mean always having a lot more next year than I have this year. Always having all sufficiency. Do you know what Christ told his followers in Matthew 6, 33? He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things should be added unto you. All these things. What are all these things? The sufficiency and necessities of life. Look what the apostles did. Uh, with, with what little they had. Look what impact they made on the world. God did it through a dozen selected men that His grace would flow into this world and, and just grow multitudinously. Always having all sufficiency in all things. If we believe that, we don't have a problem then of giving bountifully. We don't have a problem, if you will, of doing it as God desires. We don't have a problem with that. We can be a cheerful giver. You don't give it away and say, oh, I wonder if I should have given that away. Right? That's grudgingly. It's grudgingly. The rich young ruler said, I've done all these things, you know, up to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've done all these things. And Jesus says, well, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. He couldn't do that. And there's still, there's a lot of people, I believe, running around under the name of Christianity who aren't willing to do that either. We've got to be willing to do whatever God wants us to do. It's not necessarily God's will that we sell everything we have and give it to the poor. There have been times where that's been appropriate. But see, that's how God leads and directs us individually. We don't know. I mean, Laterno gave 90%. What's, you know, some give 1%. So what's the formula for us? We saw it. We saw it in verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. That is, as we predetermine through a spiritual examination of our circumstances that we might give according to God's word. And the end of verse 8 says that that we have all of these things. God makes all grace abound towards us. Why? That we always have all sufficiency in all things. And that we may abound to every good work. One of the good works we do is the gift or the grace of giving, if you will. And then he quotes uh, from Psalm 112, verse 9. And then from Isaiah uh, 55 and verse uh, 10. In verse 9, he says, As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remaineth forever. God gives freely. He gives freely. Freely. In verse 10, He that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. God's blessings to the cheerful giver are the fruits of our righteousness. Increases the fruits of our righteousness. It's where we get the expression from, you can't outgive God. You can't outgive Him. I challenge you. Well, I don't challenge you because you can't do it. Try all you want. You can't outgive God. But God loves the cheerful, cheerful giver. And there are some people who give stuff away and other people look at them and just laugh hilariously at why in the world would you do that? You know what I could do with all of that? I think it's a waste when it's actually a service to the Lord. So in verse 12, excuse me, verse 11 of our text, there's a word called enriched there. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness now, this is a different word, a different Greek word for bountifulness. This word means liberality, liberality. It means being liberal in our giving. Being enriched in everything to all liberality, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. When we're liberal in our giving, pleasing the Lord in an hilarious manner, 
What is it going to do? It's going to bring thanks to God. It's going to bring praise to God. It's a service to God. It's according to God's will. It will do that. It says they're being enriched. Hold your place there. Look back to chapter 6 and verse 10. <clears throat> you see that word enriched in chapter 9 and verse 11? Being enriched in everything to all liberality. God enriches us. Being enriched. You know what the word enriched means? It, the same word is translated over here in chapter 6 and verse 10. And it's translated as making many rich. That's the same Greek word as we find translated enriched in our text. Making many rich. Enri making many rich. So it says here in our closing verse in 2 Corinthians 9 11, being enriched in everything to all liberality. If we, if we give bountifully, we'll receive bountifully. And God enriches us. God makes us rich. It doesn't mean that he makes us wealthy. What it means is God makes all those provisions that we can exercise the obedience of liberality to God according to his word as we purpose in our heart. And God honors that and blesses that and allows us. Because it says in verse 11, um, uh, it says, being enriched in everything to all liberality. We're enriched by God. We're made rich so we can be liberal. God, when we give, God will give us more so we can give more. But we sow sparingly. God doesn't. He gives sparingly. Where are we with our giving? Have we purposed in our heart to give? We need to take the challenge from verse 7. How are we to give? According as we purpose in our heart. And that means not grudgingly or of necessity, but cheerfully. Giving cheerfully. Why? Because it's bringing praise and thanks to God. It's lifting Him up. If we're doing it in accordance with the will of God. Now, if we want to take a $100 bill and let it float down to the plate, we're getting all the glory for that. But it's when we give secretly. We give and nobody knows about it. Except the people that are getting it. Sometimes they don't even need to know about it. Many times when we give, it's necessary for some people to know about it. But <clears throat> that should not be a part of our giving. Our intent should never be that people would know what we're giving. Should never be our intent. So if we brag about how much we tip this person, we brag how much we do this, we brag how much we do that, we're taking credit for the giving. We need a purpose in our heart to do it according to God's will, and we don't need to go shouting out in the streets about it. It's that which God will honor. And when we do it God's way and we do it bountifully, what, as a blessing, as a blessing for others, understanding God wants to use us to be a blessing and we give it as a blessing to others and they will give thanks to God for it. How many times have you said and others who you've given to have said, oh, what a blessing from the Lord to receive that. What a blessing from God. When those unexpected pleasures come in time of need, uh, we, we look to the Lord. It, it doesn't have to be in a time of need in order to thank God for it. But the area of giving can be such a ministry, can be such a ministry, just the area of giving. But it must be done in accordance with God's prescript, precepts here. If we just start giving the way we think it should be done, and we give so that people know about it, uh, you know, I, I still think about the guy who ran into Richard on his motorcycle that day, and there's a big building, hospital, big hospital, big foyer, bigger than this auditorium, and big plaque on the wall about how much the person ran, about how much that person gave to build that hospital. I wonder, how private is that? How secret is that? And where, who, does, who does that praise go to? 
It goes to him. It doesn't go to the Lord. Of course, I don't believe the man professes to be a Christian uh, from, from what I've seen and heard. But the thing is that people give, and that's just an outlandish example of an extreme example, a lot of people give to be noticed. They got the so-and-so memorial fund here for college. They got the so-and-so memorial fund here for some scholarship program. And they put it in somebody's name. And then there are places where you see that the giver is anonymous. Praise the Lord for anonymous givers who give it not to be recognized, not to be rewarded, not to be praised for it, but that God gets all the thanks. Let's be a cheerful giver and, and, and give as if we're giving to the Lord because we are. It's His anyway. We're just using what He's given to us. He wants us to be good stewards. The Scripture tells us that if we're going to be faithful to God, we must be good stewards in all that we do. And that includes the money and the material things that we have. God loves a cheerful giver. Let's stand together. Father, it's not enough to say thanks for giving to us from your word today that which helps us understand your, your intention, your direction for our giving. Father, we've done it our own way all too long. We need to do it your way. May we clearly understand that, and may we adopt the principles that you've given to us. And may we be wise stewards of what you've given to us, understanding that, that blessing others with their giving brings blessings back. We need not put magnitude on any of it, except we make a determination as to what to give, and there it's necessary. But we don't give 10% to get 100% back. It's not like an investment like you would use in the stock market. We know that, Father. But the principle is that when we bless others with their giving, that they give praise and thanks to you, and you bless us in return. Only because we've accomplished your will, your way. So, Father, as we leave here today, may it be with a, with a purpose to to get deeper into the, the message and to understand how we should give as we purposeth in our heart, being led by the Holy Spirit who leads within us. And Father, we just give you praise and thanks for teaching us, guiding us through your word today, that our giving might truly be to your praise and honor in the days ahead. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.